let us start by getting a brief overview about a brief historical overview about the Manipuri dance form. Okay, um, now that's a very long and large question. Uh, you know, Manipuri dance is, um, as you know, is uh, one of the classical dance forms from India. It's from Northeast India, from Manipur. Um, I think everybody knows that. Um, now, Manipur is a very isolated place so far, and uh, since. Uh, for a long time, it is uh, it's a small valley surrounded by long, uh, by high hills, mm. steep hills, and communication with Manipur has been very difficult. Even today, it is very mm. difficult. And this is one element of Manipuri life that has really marked its history, its culture, and its tradition. This whole isolation, okay. geographical isolation. And today, uh, because of internet and everything. Um, everything is, you know, dance is becoming accessible, travel is becoming comparatively accessible, but it is still difficult to travel in a row. Now, um, Manipur is, a, I'll, I'll make a long story very short, you know, um, Manipur state is inhabited by Maitei people uh, who live in the valley, and surrounding hills are inhabited by um, so called tribes. I think we still call them tribes. Let us use the word community, perhaps community, that would probably, be a probably, less think, baggage. I think, I think our, our Indian administration likes to call them tribes, even though I don't agree Following with that Following the colonial word. model, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think I don't agree with that word. With uh, different uh, communities, uh, which were, who were termed, you know, as, as a very large bracket terms, Nagas and Cookies. Hmm. Again, that's a very problematic uh, nomenclature. Hmm. So, um, but hill, hill people, and um, valley people hmm. have a uh, very big difference in culture and ideology and history. Hmm. Um, the hill people maintain their indigeneity until accepting Christianity about a hundred years ago. On the other hand, people in the valley, they accepted, I mean there were undercurrents of many, many religions. I mean that's a, again a very complex history. But to put simplistically, they accepted Gaudiya Vaishnavism about 200 years ago when the king made Gaudiya Vaishnavism the state religion and um, he forced his people to convert into this new religion overnight. This is a popular version of the story. There are many things that happen. But if you go to Manipur and ask people about culture, this is the version you hear from everybody. This is the version at least people like to believe. And this whole conversion and its uh, repercussions has marked every part of Manipuri life, including its dance. Now, Manipuris had an indigenous dance tradition and indigenous movement traditions, I would say. Uh, the one thing, again, linking back to an overall history, because this is a very isolated valley, bordering hills, Manipur is surrounded by hostile neighbors. Yeah. Barna and you know other communities, Assam, you know, different communities. So history of Manipur, history of and there were inter-clan warfare. Even today you hear songs and folk songs about inter-clan warfare within the valley. Uh, one clan trying to establish superiority over the, other. over the other and things like that. So Manipur had a long tradition of warfare. And today if you go to Manipur, you know, I'm giving you examples because you probably have not been to Manipur, right? No, I have no, not. No. The one thing people from Bengal or from anywhere else when they go, they are very um, startled to say that the women run the place. Women run the markets, women run their life. Women give night guards in neighborhoods. Has it been a matrilineal yeah. culture? Not necessarily. Okay. No, it is not matrilineal at all. In fact, it is a very patriarchal place. Okay. But uh, the other this side, the explanation to this is men are raised and always ready to go to war. Okay. Yeah. Men are always, there are different indigenous games and uh, to keep male individuals fit, and always ready for war. So, so that any time all men have left for war, women can run the entire society. So 
that's it's a survival strategy. Yes, it is a survival strategy. So that way, that way, um, the whole war. Yes, um, we were talking about uh, wars, right? Okay. Interclan wars. Yes, interclan wars, and, and how women, women, women run the society women. when men are not around. Right. Right. Um, so for all these reasons, Manipuris have a very, very uh, sophisticated form of martial art, okay, which is actually an amalgamation, amalgamation of different techniques. It's a combination of different kind of warfare techniques. You know, there is wrestling. You know, there is um, uh, there is sword and spear. There is spear, shield and spear technique. There is there is sword technique. You know, different kinds of war techniques. So a part of the warfare, you know, when Manipur lost to war to the British, um, the first thing the British government did was to make Thangta, which is this whole you know warfare technique, yeah. illegal. Practice of Thangta, practice of uh, you know sword technique or spear technique became completely illegal. You know, my guru who I studied Kanta with used to tell us that when we were young, I still remember people um, put uh, cloth on sticks yeah. and practiced, you know, secretly inside the house, inside room of the house, so that no one could know they were practicing. So, um, so, so uh, did it remain alive? The, it the somehow problem? remained, yes, it did remain alive, but very secretly, mm -hmm. uh, with a very few tra practitioners. They were not allowed to do any kind of demonstration outside or anything like that or King who was kind of the titular head you know um, who worked under the British I mean like every other monarch under the British Empire he, he had his own uh, autonomy but at the same time he worked for the you know he was under the British Empire so he um, a puppet in the hands of the British yes completely but um, he could not uh, control that so after independence, Thangta came out, but what happened was the performers of different parts of India and also of Manipur uh, picked up Thangta as a performance technique. Now if you go to Manipur, all there are several Thangta schools, there are some very, very accomplished Thangta practitioners, but they train people not necessarily for warfare, but to go on stage. Okay. So Thangda is something very fashionable now. You know, if you go to you know theatre groups here, you know in Kolkata, I think um, it's for about the, some of the you know modern dance companies or even Manipuri dance company. It's a very fashionable thing to say for any but dancer in Kolkata. I think, oh, I've taken a Thangda workshop from somebody. Okay. You know, you know. So Thangda, you know, it was as you said. So that's that's not really a dance, but it has become a dance now. It has become a part of dance techniques now. Mm. It has been appropriated. Uh, yes, appropriate. Some, somewhat the movements have been appropriated, you know, brought in. Even not necessarily the only movement. You know, you will see a demonstration of sword and spear movements. Mm. You know, just in a warlike fashion, except they have been choreographed perfectly set to music on stage. Okay. Now the, the thangta perform performances are accompanied by music as well. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thangta. There are choreographed fights now. Mm. More like shows, hmm. which are choreographed, which are accompanied by music. Can that be because of the fact that interclan wars are no more a part of their reality, or is it a reality still? You know, um, this is very interesting that you ask this question. I mean, one of my teachers uh, was invited to um, train some underground revolutionaries. Okay. You know, in Manipur. In, 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 in just outside Manipur in Kanta, and he didn't want to go uh -huh. because of the risks. So I'm sure they are used, I'm sure our Indian military also uses, you know, unarmed combat and all kinds of techniques. I don't know whether they train them in Thangta, but um, yes, it can be used as a fight technique, I'm sure still. still. But uh, not in an interclan war context, but uh, not in a context where but it is fighting it, back yes. the Indian mainstream yes, somewhat. military force. So, somewhat. You know, people consider Thangta as a fighting technique, I'm sure. But predominantly, if you go to a Thangta school in Manipur now, yeah. you will find people coming from outside, asking for workshop to, to learn a few movements and use in some kind of theater, you know, or 
ask them to train a group to appear in a film where it is, I think in some Bengali films also they have used thangda. One or two real films they have used thangda. I know one choreographer who uses, and they bought thang from Manipur to use in some Bengali film here, okay. and so on. So, you know, thangda is uh, what I'm trying to say, it was not really a performing art per se or dance per se, but now it has become a dance somewhat. Okay. Now, the other parts of, uh, you know, Manipuri dance is uh, there are two primary kinds. One is the pre vaishnavite form, uh, that is Laiharava. And the, and the other is the uh, the other are the Vaishnavite forms. Uh, again, Manipuri dance is uh, complex in the sense it is uh, you know genre based. There are, you cannot say this is one thing is Manipuri dance that's taught in classrooms. Um, especially people like us who have stayed in Manipur for many years, um, it is a different sub traditions coming under the umbrella tradition of Manipuri dance. Okay, so there are different genres combining within yes. the rubric, right. uh, under the rubric Manipuri right. dance. Right. Um, the main genre that people outside know um, is Rashmila. Um, if you, in, especially for me, because I teach outside and, or, or some of my teachers who are taught in universities in Kolkata and elsewhere. I think um, people uh, like to say, oh my god, that dance where you wear the big uh, big drum. Mm -hmm. and oh, drum, that big drum. With that okay. big drum, oh my god, that's so, you know, I don't know. Okay. Now, uh, <laughs> the drum, you know, is a, actually a kind of skirt, it's called Kului. You know, it's a kind of skirt which is considered very sacred. It's a very sacred because um, the primary temple, Radha Krishna temple in Manipur, Govindji's temple, that's the royal temple, um, the deity wears that costume, you know, in special occasions. So it's, it is a very sacred thing for Manipuris to see that costume. Also women, when they get married, uh, uh, the bride wears that red, it of red color wears that costume. In what is it called? Is it called a ghagra? It is called a poloi. Pol. Yeah, in 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 in, in So it's um, um, it's uh, it's something that's very deeply rooted in that that skirt. Now Rash Lila um, are night long dance dramas hmm. primarily. They are dance dramas. They are night long and there are some day long Rash Lila's which are about childhood episodes of Lord Krishna. Night long Rash Lila's are about Radha Krishna's life. Okay. Rashlilas in the temple are a completely ritual experience. Uh, in the royal temple, the deities are brought out. You know, no human being plays the role of Radha Krishna. Deities are brought out and people, you know, women um, offer themselves as gopis from the community. They don't necessarily have any dance training. Just like, you know, for, uh, you know, in other parts of India, yeah, other parts of the world, many religious traditions, you have the um, custom that, uh, you know, if something happens, you make some kind of a holy promise to God that if something good happens to me, I will do this for you, I will do this for the temple, do this, something like that. In Manipur, people make promises like that, that I will uh, offer myself as gopi in Rasnega. You know? I will offer um, in other, outside, other than royal temple, Small children are are made to play role of Radha and Krishna because they have pure minds. Children under ten. Now pre puberty. Yes. Uh, so they offer their children as Radha, offering their children to play the role of Radha Krishna is a very common practice. That you know something good happens. You know I will offer you know this my my, my daughter my son as Krishna or my daughter as Krishna or Radha or something like that. So this is not necessarily any kind of show of expertise of dance by anyone. This whole thing is a completely ritual experience, very personal ritual experience for people. Now there are some professionals who are engaged to keep the Rasvila going, you know. But primarily people who, who participate in it, the, the big group of groupies, they are all 
way and it goes on for all night. It's a very deeply spiritual experience. You know, uh, this is one thing that I tell everybody, you know, all students, you know, people who come to learn or wherever I give lectures, lecture demonstrations, so my own students, that uh, uh, no matter how many specimens, and I experience this personally as a performer, that you know, I grew up in Kolkata, you know, learning computer dance in, uh, in the classrooms. You know, I got certificates and I, you know, I got auditioned at TV, I performed in festivals and everything. But until you've offered yourself in a Rashtrila, you know, in the temple, at least once, um, you have not reached the essence of the dance form as a performer. No way. You know, your education remains incomplete until you've gone through that experience. And it's a, um, you know, uh, the day, night before Rashtrila, evening before Rashtrila, um, the last rehearsal day, you have a little celebration, a small worship, and for that whole night, you know, the next day, all day you have vegetarian food, you know, you pray, and then the night comes for Rasila. That's a really a night for prayer and when you are dancing. How closely dance is related to worship, you can never experience unless you've done, you know, you've performed in Rasila or participated in Rasila. I will never call Rasila performance, it's more participated in Rasila or offer yourself in Rasila by yourself. So this is something that I always emphasize very much when I meet young dancers. Okay. So this is one kind, you know, the big skirt and everything. Okay. Now the others, uh, again, uh, very, very um, highly like um, publicized and somewhat exoticized genre is Nato Shankar, which is, um, uh, you know, very commonly the uh, rhythm dancers, men, you're wearing white and, and, and dancing with the drums and, and doing these uh, whirlwind, mm, right, right, yeah. right, doing these whirlwind turns, right? That's considered very exotic. But the, uh, that is again a uh, vehicle of worship actually. Natasha Kirtan is something that is uh, done in every rite of passage function. So if you go to a wedding and Natasha Kirtan is a mask in a shraddha, you know, that, that is yeah, what yeah, I was yeah, going to ask. Yeah. is a must. Mm. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, the Pala players are considered, uh, you know, the most sacred people in the Rana Shankirtan next to the priest. Mm. Um, and it I, is, uh, Sankirtan is of course uh, accompanied by words as well as music. Uh, music, uh, vocal music mm. with narration mm. and symbol playing. And, and what also, is the language? Okay, you are... Um, Treading some troubled waters now. Okay. 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 Now, Nautra Shankirtan, since it is a Vaishnavite genre, when Nautra Shankirtan started originally, the language was Padavali language. Okay. Prajapur? Yes. Prajapasha. Depending on the poet, you know, Chandidash is, as you are a literature student, you know that, you know, Chandidash's Bhasha was very Bengali oriented. Uh, yeah, my, it's a mixture of Maithili, yeah, Bengali, yes, Oriya, yeah, Ahaya, yes, yes, everything. Yeah. Everything, right? Um, uh, there are many, many Ma Maithili gurus mm -hmm. who wrote in Prajapasha also. Uh, they wrote in like pure Bengali. You know, after that whole conversion, you know, when Maithili, when Gaudiya Vishnuism became a state religion, you know, the society turned around and really embraced Gaudiya Vishnuism. And Gaudiya Vaishnavism went to Manipur and took its own form. What Vaishnavism you see, the Maitei Vaishnavism is completely different from Bengali or Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Okay, it has in what its ways? own form. It has its own incarnation there. In the sense, you know, in Bengali Kirtan, mm -hmm. you saw sitting down and playing, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Maitei Shankirtan is complete. Maitei is also do Kirtan. Mm -hmm. Manipur people also sit, sit and sing. You know, and play the khol also, but the meti pum, the 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 drums with which you see these dancers turn, you know, um, they have, there are different kinds of drums and probably oversimplifying. The main drum which is used as accompaniment in Manipuri dance, the pum, it is somewhat of a cross, you know, between uh, a Bengali khol turned into. In reincarnated in Manipur, in Manipur okay. soil. So it there was an indigenous uh, kind of drum also. Yes, there were many indigenous kinds many of indigenous drums, kind of which are still there. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the Bengali khul reincarnated itself to be accompanied in these Vaishnavite 
music, mm -hmm. mu music and dance traditions mm -hmm. as food. And the entire Tal system mm -hmm. from Kirtur went there and took its own form. Okay, Maitri Gurus added their own things and Maitri Gurus wrote Padavalis themselves and created this tradition which is very rich and it is very distinct. It is not a copy from anybody. And that's it's a reception yes, of a kind. Yes, yes. So um, that is one thing um, I think one has to respect when you go to Manipur, of course. Um, now, um, coming back to different kinds of uh, uh, dance forms, the overview of dance forms. So, um, Natashan Kirtan, you know, is uh, one kind. Um, that is, the drums are uh, traditionally played only by men. My guru was uh, a rebel. He taught drumming to women for the first time. Okay. Um, and the singing is done by both men and women. It, depending on the occasion, you know, singers, the gender of singers are chosen. Now, the other tradition, Rupipala, which is kind of a sister tradition to Ramachandrita, is um, actually the base of Abhinaya. Abhinaya pieces, Abhinaya in Manipur. Okay. Now, I have many hours of video recordings, I wish I could show them to you, uh, where uh, singers, female singers, they dance, sing and enact the love life of Krishna, Radha and Krishna. And there are beautiful songs and they do Abhinaya. They, they recite dialogues, they narrate dialogues and do Abhinaya. Um, and the genesis of you know, our classical stage based Abhinav pieces is from this. So, this is pretty much an overview. Now, what you see as classical dance, classical Manipuri dance on stage, um, comes from these Vaishnavite traditions and from Lai Harava. Did I talk about Lai Harava or did no, I? No, we it? haven't talked about, okay. talked about that. Now, these are the Vaishnavite traditions. So, among the pre Vaishnavite traditions, we have Thangta and we have Lai Harava. Lai Harava is an indigenous festival, it's a pre Vaishnavite festival done within, between April and June in different parts, like you do Dula Pujo in different uh, neighborhoods in Kolkata. In Manipur also people do Lai Harava in different uh, neighborhoods. Okay, uh, you know, one neighborhood there is a temple, and neighbors raise money, there is sponsorship, just like Dula Pujo. Okay, so and Lai Harava may continue for one day depending on the strength. Of okay. the budget, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it may be one day, it may be uh, three days, it may be seven days, it may be ten days. Moiram Harava, which is very, very um, popular, very, very famous, mm -hmm. Moirang is known for Lai Harava, it goes for one month. Okay. Uh, and there are different functions from morning to evening every day. Is, is there any deity to whom this yes. festival is? The deity is the old, the deities, local deities, local mm -hmm. indigenous deities. From different, uh, from different neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Every neighborhood has its own indigenous deity, has its own history. If you go to Manipur, and you know, just like any part of the world, and I'm giving you reference from Bengal because you are from Bengal. You know, if you go to different neighborhoods, like my grandmother's village in in, in Howrah, there is a deity called Vishalakhi. Yes. Uh, which I'm sure, being Bengali, you know. Any where in India you go, people will not people know, will not know because, know yeah. right? The, because these deities are perhaps not part of the Margi culture, right? But they are right. more of a desi, desi origin, right? Right. So, in Manipur, also, if you go to different neighborhoods, different localities, there are indigenous deities like that who are worshipped through Lai Haraba. They are worshipped throughout the year in some way or the other, but Lai Haraba is a big festival dedicated for them. This is where you have my bees or the female priests of Manipur who dance to the gods. They describe the creation myth and they also direct community dancing. First we would like to hear something about how you yourself were initiated into the Manipuri dance form. Secondly, uh, we'd like to hear something about your guru who has been legendary in many ways and uh, has a historical significance in the whole context of Manipuri dance form and it's, uh, it's raising to the level of uh, classical form.
and thirdly uh, how music itself is accompanied in the uh, in the whole context of dance and whether a special training is also needed in music to be trained in the dance form as well okay um first of all you know i um, you know i was born in late 60s in kolkata i was born in 1966 you know um, the same year my mother was also born okay that's uh, so so you know you can call me washi or anything so um anyway so i started training you know i had a knack for dancing so my parents put me in a neighborhood dance dance class just like you know many parents of you know that generation um, there there was a teacher who was uh, who was who knew my guru and learned from him so he told my mother that you know you can put shoe in my guru school he has just come to kolkata and opened the school that was in 1974 okay when you were just 8 years old yes um, i was actually less than i was that was in 74 to i was going to be eight, i was 7 7 so i went to my mother put me and took me in june my mother took me to my guru school which was in uh, you know legal school in kolkata in devanagaram uh, part so fourth floor of legal school we used to have class guruji was in his 50s at that time and palavati devi is now you know guru palavati devi and they are all my devotee uh you may have heard of uh palavati devi was pregnant at that time with devotee so i am that old you know so anyway so uh, and within about 6 months of training my guru told my mother the first the monipuri dartanala had been kolkata had been just registered at an institution the year before 1973 so we were among the we were very fortunate we were among the first students and among the, in the children's group uh, i stuck in the first production of monipuri dartanala in children's group i played the lead role of krishna in 6 months guru ji said you should can do it 75 kolkata television opened okay and we were our children's group We have production Goshtalila, which is adaptation of Goshtalash. It was the first production to be aired in Kolkata television at that time, at end of 1970, December of 1970. We were Kolkata at that time. One or two very rich houses had TV, yeah. and uh, you know after uh, the take, you know we, uh, my mother, my parents inquired different families who has a TV, you know, and our telecast. we went to see in somebody's house and tv was such a novel thing mm. and that my first time i saw a tv what a tv was like um, you know i saw my own dancing you know so um, those were the very different kind of days you know but in a class we learn i learned in a class okay, in a classroom so as i grew up you know i learned in a classroom uh, manipur afternoon i was a very intense institution um slowly as i grew up my guru asked my mother and um and this is this is one place i think i have to mention the role of my guru in my making of a dancer and my guru asked one day told my mother why to send shoini to my house sometimes you know um i think she's i think i like her you know i like teaching her so i was about 8 8 and a half so at that time guruji never demanded any money or there was no hourly fees or anything like that I just used to be at that time. Guruji and Bhagwan would be living in Nukulesha Bhatta Jilin, this one Nukulesha Bhatta Jilin, and they in two rooms. They were also went through much economic hardship at that time. You know, I used to go to their house and just learn. And one day, I think we were preparing for some function. You know, I was uh, I was actually studying in class two at that time. Uh, Guruji, Guruji. as you say he is a famous figure is a very famous he is a legend yes he is a legend of course i now i will realize he is a legend at that time when i was 8 years old i had no idea that he was a legend he was this uh, very intense and very loving man who was filled with knowledge in my eyes he was a source of this mystical knowledge which i wanted to acquire and he was a very affectionate person he really loved children and so one day guruji was entertaining the children three or four of us we were sitting there we were all eight ten you know that age group so guruji was looking at people's palms and giving you know predictions about their future 
So he, he was telling people things that, you know, that people were getting upset or people were like laughing or he was actually, you know, needling people. He liked to do that. Guru Naam. Huh? Guru Naam. My Guru we will say. Okay. So Guruji looked at my palm and all of a sudden became uh, very stern and he told me, I think you are going to become a very great dancer one day. And, you know, I thought he was joking. You know, because everything else he had told everybody at that time, uh, Guruji had, they were all jokes. You know, he had told somebody that you are going to have three, uh, three boys and four girls, seven children, be ready for it. And she got totally upset. She said, no way, I cannot do, I, I will not have so many children, you know. Guruji, what are you telling me? And so, you know, he was joking around and, you know, telling, entertaining kids, but feeling that he had told me something that, uh, you know, stayed, I felt that it was very strange that he said that. But slowly as I grew up, you know, I saw somewhat when also, you know, destiny was such that things opened up for me. You know, I uh, went, I used to take ex get extra lessons in Guruji's house, free of cost, um, for no reason. Then I got solo, solo stints, you know, in Kapitanarai's um, shows. And then I interviewed for the National Scholarship, National Cultural Talent Scholarship. I got the scholarship when I was 14. And I was among the first people to get it in Monipuri Dance. At that time, this scholarship had now, which is called CCRT Scholarship. It was directly under the Ministry of Culture. Some very prominent people, artists today, you know, got it with me. And, but then, it is very interesting because I don't come from a practicing artist family. In fact, my parents were never very happy that I could come dancing so seriously and we did ever studio as a baby. Um, and I was not born in Manipur also. Um, so I am one of those people. Many, many years later, you know, I things came started coming, the national scholarship came. Guruji all of a sudden said, show me from tomorrow you're going to come and help me with these books, okay? I studied in class 8 at that time. I said, okay Guruji, I used to go to Guruji's house just like that, you know, we sat, talked, talked about dance, danced a little bit. It was not like today is that children, you know, go for hourly lessons and come back and pass an exam or do one or two recitals and, you know, and that's it. It was something, it was Guruji's, going to Guruji's house was a part of our lives. So I, I in fact, you know, Whatever opportunity I got, I used to run away to Guruji's house and sit and look at what he was doing. Because whatever he did, it was somewhat, as I said, this very mysterious world that I wanted to enter and I wanted to conquer somewhat. Okay. So, you know, so unknown to me, you, oh, you, you will help me with these books, okay, I need somebody to go through these things and tell me these things, you know. Uh, okay, Guruji, I will come tomorrow. And then I became Guruji's research assistant. At one point, I co wrote a manuscript with my guru called Misconceptions in Monopoly Dance. Okay. And the manuscript is still there. Guruji is no more. So I never really went, out, went up about publishing it. Maybe I should. I don't know about it. Those are decisions, the hard decisions to make. So, even my initial, um, you know, kind of my initial interest in doing academic research came also from Guruji. Just like performance came from Guruji, the academic research also came from Guruji. So when I was in 12th class, um, class 12, um, uh, Kapil, Dr. Kapila Bachchan, who all hmm. of you have heard of, um, came to visit Manipur Nakhonaya Kolkata. visited my Guru's archives in school. And Guruji introduced two or three of us um, to Kapilaji. And uh, uh, Kapilaji talked to me for some time and said that, you know what, if you want to do research on dance, you may want to take up either Sanskrit or history or anthropology. So I said that I thought about it and I thought maybe anthropology is a better thing for me because it is in Calcutta. Was, I was very keen on mathematics. I was very good in math and I, I still enjoy doing math as a hobby. Uh, maybe since I had some kind of science inclination, maybe in Calcutta University it is taught as a science stream, maybe I could take up anthropology. So that was my history, how I went into anthropology. Okay, it was all kind of came as direction from somewhere I don't know. So, um, and I did, I got my BSc degree, honors degree, and then my uh, MSc degree. 
my MSc, my dissertation paper, we call it dissertation in India. In the US, they call it the reverse. I think PhD is called thesis and MA is called dissertation, dissertation. In, 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 India, in India, right? In the US, it's the above. PhD okay. is dissertation and, and MA is thesis. MA is thesis. Okay. So I wanted to clarify that. So my MA paper, I my MSc research paper, I took on a project on society and dance in Manipur. That was the beginning of my field work in Manipur. And since that was in 1991, before that I had visited Manipur as a dancer in 1988, stayed in Guruji's house, started to pick up a few phrases of Medeo. 1991, I was there full fledged. I learned Medei by just contact method. There was no courses at that time um, or anything like that. I you know, stayed in villages, did survey, collected data and started being exposed to the very roots of the tradition, the roots of the dance room, which is there in all the festivals. And you know, as I said, and as one of your questions you know, that came, that you, know, you say it is a living tradition. Yes, it is a living tradition. But you have to, as a dancer, just learning in class and you know, becoming a good performer and you know, going to a festival, becoming famous is not enough. You have to know the rules. Just living tradition word, knowing the word living tradition is not enough. You have to go it and remains empty if you don't you, have the you, experience. Yeah, if you, you have to go and experience what a living tradition is by living there really and living in the tradition. And I was very fortunate, I guess my, my anthropological fieldwork training you know, really prepared me to do that. So day after day I, you know, I lived in the villages in Holi, during Holi. Ensemble performance called Holi Pala. My first field work, I stayed at the village I was staying, had a really nice, a really good Holi Pala ensemble. I actually went singing with the villagers. In I performed with the villagers in different villages. Day after day, I think for like six, seven days, I was continuously traveling with the villagers in buses, you know, uh, to perform, you know, with, with the villagers themselves, you know, in the Holi Pala. So that way, I, it re, that was a really eye-opening thing for me. That exactly where the roots are and where where the emphasis should be in learning. You know, techniques is fine. You should should be perfect in your technique in the classroom, and you, know, you should know how to perform in stage and everything to be a performer. But at the same time, as I said, that's not enough. Living there and learning that gives you a completely different perspective. When you really come to know the dance. So that's I think a very important part of my. Training. As I mentioned before, um, then performing the Rasa, then 97 I went back for my PhD, PhD period. I lived there for two years, 97 to 99, in uh, my guru's house, and I was doing research in different villages. So, uh, I'll just interrupt you here. Yeah. Uh, in this context, could you also talk about uh, talk something about your thesis? Right now, for my MA thesis, now uh, okay, to come back to my own journey. After I finished my uh, master's degree in Kolkata, I had the opportunity to go to the United States to do a second master's in dance you know, in UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles. I was uh, there for, uh, it was a two year degree, and I did my thesis, it, uh, MA thesis there on Maite revivalism and Manipur dance. Sociocultural revival movement that is going on in Manipur and how that is impacting dance. You know, for that, I went back to Manipur you know, in '94 um, to do my field work, to do my research. Um, and then I, was, I became very interested in the, this uh, cultural revival movement uh, because, you know, from day one in, in Manipur in Arthanarai or in my I knew that Manipuri dance, Manipuri culture is a part of Vaishnavite culture. And there is a pre Hindu tradition, pre Vaishnavite tradition, but that's there. But the whole idea that in early part of the 20th century, there was a uh, movement started among Manipuri communities in Kachar, then it spread to Manipur for eradicating Vaishnavism and reviving. 
their Manipuri's own, Manipur's own old cultural tradition, its religion and its writing system, language and writing system. You know, this whole you know, Sanawahi movement, there are many names to this movement. You know, and this movement has many forms, many proliferations, cultural, social, political, everything. You know? So this whole movement, I found it very interesting. And I wanted to study that movement, you know, and different aspects of that movement. So I started with, you know, and this movement actually I stumbled upon it quite by accident during my field work. Okay. In one of the first villages where I was living for a month, you know, I stumbled across um, some practitioners who do not follow Vaishnavism. If you ask them what your religion is, if you ask Manipuris of that generation at that time, what is your religion? They will say, oh, it is Gauri Vaishnavism. Now, if you ask a globalized uh, IT professional who lives in Bangalore, Manipuri IT professional who lives in Bangalore, he and she may give you a different reply. But if you ask a villager today, even today, people will say, oh, our religion is Gauri Vaishnavism. Okay. Now, but then, there were some families who identified themselves as not believers of Gauri Vaishnavism. We don't do those things. Then I slowly, that movement really, really interested me. That where is this anger coming from? That there are families who do not, who do not even see that. I actually had the fortune of staying with a family when this 80 year old lady told me, oh my goodness, we don't even see Rasvidas. Those are dirty things. You know, we don't see them. This is a very traditional Manipuri lady, but she is com completely averse to anything by Shravai, including Rashtra, which Manipuri is known for. So at that time, you know, I was in my early 20s, and I became very interested in the knowing the genesis of this anger. You know, why is this section of society so interested in boycotting Rasthila and boycotting all the beautiful things that we as outsiders have treasured Manipur for. Okay. So I did my thesis on the impact of Maitri revivalism on Manipur dance. Okay. And then after my MA ended, I got admission PhD in anthropology. And by that time, I had discovered you know, a Maitri Mayak alphabet book, which really fascinated me. Because you know, the Maitri Mayak philosophy based on the philosophy of the body. Every letter is shaped like a body part. Okay. Yes. And this is, uh, you know, you can call, you can say, you know, in, in Indic philosophy also there is, you know, chakras and, you know, yogic chakras mm -hmm. and letters mm -hmm. coming out. But this whole idea of letters, you know, becoming icons of this whole divine body, you know, and the whole relationship between body philosophy and its proliferation in the linguistic arena, I was became very interested in. So that was my PhD work. And by and large, you know, the uh, you, the Manipuri language revival of which Maitimai revival of Maitimai is a part of, you know, you know when I was, you know, that now that you say that I'm your mother's age, you know, when I was very, very young, um, in 1970s, I'm sure your mother will also remember. You know, uh, 1972, Bangladesh was formed. Uh -huh. You know, my one of my earliest memories is Joy Bangla. Yeah. The word Joy Bangla going around, you know, the whole fervor and the excitement mm -hmm. that there was a country being formed where Bangla is the national language, and we all were in, even in Kolkata. Kolkata I mean, people were very, very big supporters. Right? India was one uh -huh. of the biggest supporters of the People came from there. Also. Yes. Yes, it came from our day, it came from there. So, um, so I think part of one of my earliest, some of those earliest memories of um, nationalism for Bengali, I think had stayed with me. And when I saw, but you know, I grew up in late 80s and when I was your age, I was late 80s, early 90s, our generation did not feel as excited about Bangla or, you know, somehow we were political, we were not even, the, we were not the Naksal generation, you know, not not we were the later generation. So we were somewhat sandwiched between. You know, so you may want to edit this part out. 
neither the uh, Nokshan generation nor the Nandi Gram generation. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, you were somewhat sandwiched between. So, I felt our generation, our uncles and all who were participating in the Nakshanite movement, they had that kind of fervor, political fervor, mm -hmm. which I saw among youths in money. That excitement that this is ours and we have to claim ours and we have to fight for our right. So um, that I identified and I became very interested in the movement. That whereas, you know, people are fighting for their rights, um, at the same time they are not, uh, you know, where is this anger coming from? At the same time they want to separate uh, the, the dance in such a way hmm. that um, even today in seminars I get questions, why, are you, why did you choose Rasalina as an example of Manipuri dance? That is not ours. And my always response is, of course it is yours. Where will Rasila come from other than Manipur? Yeah. But that's not our thing, that's a different thing. Okay. I get, three years ago I gave a seminar in JNU, Manipur students, uh, in Center for Manipur Studies. Manipur students have come from everywhere. Your generation Manipur students in, in JNU. You know, and, and there were students who would ask me, that, why, why do you still do Rasila? You know, as our thing, that's not our thing, that's my own thing, that's, that's my own thing. You know, and I don't agree with that. That's just like Lahorba is yours, you know, Rasalina is not Bengali at all. It is very Manipuri. It is, it, is, it, it, is, uh, it is a product of that amalgamation which, you know, we, you cannot deny. Yeah. Yes, you cannot the be the least, least, yes. even if and you want. At the same time, I was very interested in making Mike. And the people who were fighting for making are some of the very, very um, staunch and uh, very extremist, you know, um, anti-Hindu, anti-Indian activists who are not necessarily political activists, they are all cultural activists, but some of the very so-called notorious names of Manipuri history have given me so much affection and support, um, I cannot believe that. One of the, there's one gentleman, I will mention his name, he's a, he's a legend now in Manipur. His name is Shri Suba Makaba. He, his group had set fire to several Hindu temples because he want, they wanted to eradicate, eradicate Hinduism. His group had set fire to Manipur State Central Library, State's Library okay. because it had Bengali books. Okay. So, he was one, he had been one of my biggest supporters. You know, first time I went to his house, you know, you will not believe this. He was shocked out of daylight that I had come. I was Bengali, you know, I had come from Kolkata, then I had gone to US, but all the way from US, being Bengali, I had gone to Manipur and I was walking around in search of my Bengali revivalism. You know? And that day, you know, I, I will never forget this. He um, assembled all his uh, boys, you know, mm. and some of them are, you know, Paramunda type, you know, and said that, look, uh, you know, this is someone who has come out of her own society to us. This is not a place she has her father or her uncle, you know, her brother protecting her. So it is my duty to protect her. Mm. So all of you know her. Um, whenever she comes, you have to do everything she asks for. So this gentleman in Manipur, in this was I remember, this was the end of May, June, in the middle of heavy monsoon like this, you know, um, you know, streets are flooded, you know, there's rain going on, there is, you know, mud, slush, everything. Um, he went in his uh, scooter and asked his people to get, I, mean, I was looking for cassettes of uh, music, of Meitei theme music, which were slowly becoming fashionable at that time women who had sung. Now of course those cassettes and CDs are found everywhere. You know? So he came to my house and brought so many cassettes for me and he refused to take a penny from me. You know? And so his daughter, he one day I remember I came to his house, nobody else was there. He called, he telephoned his daughter to school and said my daughter has to come home right now. Because I have this lady who has come here, she's here alone and all my boys are here and I want my daughter to sit with her so that she does not feel uncomfortable. And you know, I had go 
on to in the US on my, you know, by myself and, you know, studying with all these people, you know, from every part of the world. And, you know, gone to Manipur, gone everywhere on my own. But he felt he needed to protect, protect. me to such an extent that he called his daughter out of school, you know, to miss her school. He was, she was some class 10 or class 11 student. She came home from school and sat with me till evening so that when I was conducting my interview. So that kind of support, I don't think I've ever received anywhere from this gentleman who's supposedly very notorious. And anybody, you know, in um, in places like Kolkata, he would be shrieking, you know, hearing his name, all the things that he has done. Okay. He was involved in politics. I he had a complicated career. Unfortunately, he was um, uh, murdered, you know, a few years ago. So his death was very, very. Um, Controversial also. People, I'm sure people know who did it, but it was a very, very, very difficult and a very, very sad story. But anyway, so this is the kind of support I have gotten from from Manipuri society as well. So that's uh, my research, and later on, you know, as, as in my PhD, I continue with it for um, you know for uh, on basing on linguistic anthropology. So um, I, I focused on the aspect of the movement that involves Mete Mayek or Manipuri, Manipuri script mm -hmm. yeah, was my PhD work. I guess I gave you a long, long, long yeah, round answer but I had to mention some of these of things. Course. Uh, to come back to Manipuri dance, Yes. Uh, we are talking about the whole question of scriptures. Yes. And how that is related to the elevation of Manipuri to a classical level. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was you, explaining it to you, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, could you yes. talk about a little bit of 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 that history, uh, how, when, and how that started to happen? Okay. I think now, I guess you were asking me about the short project, uh, the project I did for the article. That uh, I guess uh, one of the questions I saw in the questionnaire yes. about the, the article that won the Gemini Prize. Okay. So that is an article where I actually combined my two lives. You know, my mm -hmm. life as a linguistic anthropologist, um, where I studied Mehdi Maek, and uh, my life as a dance researcher. You know, and, and a dancer, because a good part of the article is based on my experience as a dancer. As a dancer. Yes. So um, in that article, you know, and it is called the language of hand gestures in Manipuri dance, semantics and politics. Semantics and politics. Um, so that article, now the one thing um, as a practitioner of Manipuri dance, wherever I go to teach, the one thing, um, and I don't know whether you realize, all my Manipuri dance teacher friends will tell you, and I will also tell you, getting students for Manipuri dance is very difficult. Because common perception of Manipuri dance is it is very slow in, in India. In India. It is difficult in foreign countries, in the US also. Uh, for other reasons, but in India, I just heard from someone. It's so slow and it's so boring. You know, this lady, she's uh, she used to learn Manipur dance, then she pursued other profession. Now she's married, and her her husband really dislikes Manipur dance because uh, he thinks it's very slow and very boring, and it should not be pursued. So their daughter. But isn't that the perception okay. about all classical forms? Uh, not necessarily. Not about Bharatnatyam? No, not, not at Pathak all. Pathak perhaps has a different history, but... No, I, I, amongst all, you know, Manipuri, all classical dances that, at least in Kolkata or any other place, everybody will tell you it is so slow and it is so boring. So Manipuri dance in many ways, it is this very other dance, it's very otherified. You know, it's this other form, which is never belonged to India really, you know. Or aesthetically, I think Indian audience cannot accept Manipuri dance. This is my this is my own perception as a practitioner that Manipuri dance practitioners are always pressured to adopt aesthetics that is not theirs. That is partly theirs maybe, but that makes the look different. That makes the look more like other classical dance forms. Okay which not necessarily the classical dance forms in the temple era, but the stage era. Hmm. It's a whole different aesthetics, which living in India, in urban India, uh, dance practitioners are always pressured to adopt. Okay. 
Now, here, you know, I in this article, I have traced um, the history of Manipuri dance and coming back to my dance teacher perspective, one question a lot of people ask me, so your Manipuri dance, does it have mudras? The correct word is not even mudras, the correct word is hastas. You know, do you have hand gestures? I have heard Manipuri dance doesn't have any hand gestures. You know? That's a question so many people have asked me whenever they have come to you know, admit their daughters to my school or you know something like that. So, um, or whenever I've gone somewhere, oh you know I teach but so do your Manipur dance have mudras? Does your Manipur dance have this? So it is always this other form. Are you, uh, implicitly we are always asked, are you good as us, as good as us? Are you as good as other Indian dance forms? So anyway, um, so I became very interested in doing a project on hand gestures and in this project what I have done is I have looked at uh, the hand gesture traditions in the pre-Vaishnavite form and the Vaishnavite form. In the Vaishnavite form there is a very rich hand gesture tradition. Maimis when they dance the creation myth they use hastas, they use hand gestures and they use pretty much all the hand gestures that are available anywhere, any scripture, or any Indian scripture, or anywhere else. Mm. But those hand gestures are not given any names. Okay, they are done. You know, they are performed in the ritual, as in a very ritualistic way. Okay. Then later on, I have traced the history of modernity in Manipur, where after independence, you know, Manipur became a part of India. And uh, teaching academies started developing, curriculums started developing, mm -hmm. the whole notion of giving examinations started developing, you know. Um, all these things came in, uh, giving exams, you know, passing exams, uh, getting a degree, getting a certificate, all these concepts came in, came into being. And with that, there was a necessity to uh, show. Um, link Manipuri dance with scriptures, with Vaishnavite scriptures, you know. Not that the links were not there, the links were very much there. But Manipuri dancers are always pressured to prove themselves as Indian every day. Okay. And that seems like a rather odd phenomenon to me. That why is it that we are always told, are you as good as us? So anyway, so in this um, history, in this project, what I've done is I've looked at how Abhinaya Dharma uh, hand gestures uh, were um, are taught in academies as they are used in Manipuri dance, classical Manipuri dance. Different schools of Manipuri dance do it a little differently. Um, students in classes are taught hand gestures in sequences with Sanskrit names. Okay. Sanskrit. Since it is coming from Abhinaya Dharma. Yeah, or even when it is used in Manipuri dance in classes, the Sanskrit names are used. Mm. Okay. So that it is easier to call it a classical form. Yes, yes. So, and you are answering your own question. Mm. To become a classical form, that whole idea of Sanskritization is so important. Mm. To prove yourself to be of the high Indian order. Mm. Right? Mm. Now, um, later on, there was one scholar and dance teacher uh, who sequentially uh, wrote a book. He collected uh, the hand gestures from the YBs and he gave, from the YBs of the female priests, and he gave Meitei names to them, names in Meitei language to them. So I have traced, I have discussed how naming is so important, nameless gestures and name gestures, the politics of naming and the politics of um, language. Because now we have the same gestures and we have the names, but the names are not in Sanskrit, they are in the indigenous language. Okay. So now they have been given some name. Yes. There is a book on it. Now, whether the book is followed in any class, we don't know. That person has passed away. He used to teach in the Jawaharlal Nehru Dance Academy. 
he has passed away and after that I don't know whether anybody teaches his sequence on that. Okay. But this whole idea that he wanted to have named gestures at the same t time indigenize the names. I thought that was a very striking phenomenon. Wasn't there any pre-Vaishnavite manual where certain names were given or certain uh, grammar of the dance was it? There are several um, puyas you know, on the dance philosophy, on the festival philosophy. But then, again, I'll answer a question that I we were discussing, I think, right before the interview, that it is very, this is again something as a practitioner and a researcher, I find very interesting, that um, bodily knowledge, people, practitioners who have bodily knowledge, um, always feel the need to prove themselves, prove their knowledge with books. Because if you go to a practitioner who has practiced, who has been a practitioner all their lives and ask them about something, I've seen people and I, I'm probably asking that person that, you know what, uh, can you tell me how you do this? I want a part of the experience, of the lived experience, which to me as a practitioner is much more valuable than any books. Right? So, but that person will bring out a book, will say, wait, 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 what I'm saying is not important, I'll bring out a book. Yeah, because it perhaps gives the knowledge a certain authoritativeness. I think so. And I think this is one place I think practitioners should reevaluate re their preference and come up and say that, you know, my deep knowledge and my, um, my deep experience and my bodily knowledge is more important than what is written in a book by a third scholar. So I think that this is one place where you have you know, the whole politics between bodily knowledge and textual knowledge, uh -huh. which I've also looked at. Do you have always heard about the importance of oral transmission of knowledge as far as all these classical old forms of uh, dance and music are concerned? So when you say that uh, the knowledge of the written word is so important in this context, I am a little, I, I wonder where to place the whole question of orality in that context. You know, that's a very large question. And the orality and oral tradition versus written tradition, right? Yeah. Which is more important. Now, the very old school scholars will say that written tradition is more important, you know. Oral tradition, people with oral tradition have a different capacity. There are scholars who have said that we don't agree with that anymore. Mm. Oral tradition is as important as written tradition. Yes. So there are so many things that are being transmitted through oral traditions, you know, that uh, we cannot uh, live without now. Mm. Right? And oral tradition, when transcribed to a written tradition, also takes a third place. Yeah. Right. So. Um, but somehow that uh, that lived experience yes. and how it yes. it changes across generations. And 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 also, you, you know, as a dancer. You know, I will always say that, you know, that uh, going back to the root and going for the lived experience, not necessarily, you don't have to be very romantic about it, that, you know, very exotic about no. it, that you have to go and live in a, some, uh, you know, Remote. some place, some yeah. place or anything like that. Um, anything you do, you know, but it, it influences your thought, it influences your form. You know, if you see the, you know, the... Um, uh, the, creep, uh, the bamboo uh, in Manipur, you know, you see blue hills in the horizon and bamboo groves and uh, paddy fields. You know, when you see and live in, in such an atmosphere, you start thinking a certain way. Yeah, the whole yes. climate yes. has an Even impact. Even if you sit in a cyber cafe in Monaco Bazaar, yeah. you know, the whole uh, air smells different. You know, in a, even in the cyber cafe, the air smells different, and because you see blue hills in the horizon sometimes, from sometimes, or you hear some like however somebody's uh, some penaiche shakpa going on somewhere, you know. So those this you know like you know you can um, sit in um, you know cafe coffee day in Kolkata, uh, at the same time you'll hear dhak during Durga Pujo, and it will smell different, right? So those are all things that make up a culture, right? So it's like that. Um, no matter what you do, sitting in Manipur, uh, you start thinking a certain way when you live there. You 
and it requires and it is an amalgamation everything no water you know power cut curfew you know within all of that uh, it, there is there is some element that takes you and makes you think a certain way makes your dance experience a certain way um, and it is not something that I can explain by words or explain by writing you can read 10 books and you will never um, uh, you know you will not reach the essence yeah, yeah, reach the essence have that perception